Today we're going to talk about a hidden killer deadlier than the plague, and you may even have this infection. It's extremely common. In fact, one in four people have this bacterial infection, and many people don't even know that they have it. It's a bacteria that killed more people than the plague. The plague killed 200 million people. If we take a look at the accumulated people that this bacteria killed, it's over 1 billion people. And each year, this bacteria kills just under 1.3 million people, yet it's not even really in the news. You don't hear much about it, even though it is the world's deadliest infectious disease, which kills more people than HIV and malaria combined. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not just because it's very common. It infects 25% of the population. That's over 2 billion people on planet Earth. If you were infected, you would need to know this information. The somewhat good news about this particular bacteria is the great majority of this infection, 95% of it is in an inactive stage. It's in a dormant, latent stage. So only about 5% of this bacterial infection is in the active stage. Despite that, there's over a million people a year that die. It's contagious. It affects the lung. And it's one of the oldest pathogens that has evolved to persist or survive in your body in a dormant state. And so actually there's a group of microbes in your body that can go in and out of remission. And they're called latent infections. Like for example, herpes and Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus and human papillomavirus and hepatitis B or C are all latent microbes. But the microbe that I'm gonna focus on today is TB, which is a microbe that gives you tuberculosis. It doesn't actually evade your immune system. It goes into your immune system. It actually hides in the macrophage. Now, what's a macrophage? The macrophage is part of the immune cells that actually attack TB and they clean up bacteria and infection throughout the body. So as soon as it engulfs it, it has certain enzymes to dissolve it put acid into it, kill it, and dismantle it. But with TB, once the macrophage eats it, TB has a certain defense mechanism to block these powerful digestive enzymes. And so TB has this protective shield that it starts to build around it within the macrophage. In fact, it doesn't even kill this macrophage. What it does is it hijacks its fuel source in its mitochondria. And of course, to survive, it stays in this dormant mode. And it just waits, okay, until the timing is right before it comes out and creates damage. TB affects more people in the northern hemisphere, okay, away from the equator, and more incidents in the winter than the summer. And there's several states or conditions that dramatically bring that microbe into an active state if you have type 2 diabetes if you have HIV, which lowers the immune barrier. When you get older, the immune system gets weaker. And, and this is the most important thing, if your vitamin D is very low, that inactive or what they call latent bacteria go into an active state and start creating damage. So if you didn't already guess it, vitamin D actually is very low in the north compared to areas of the equator because of where the sun is. And also, of course, in the winter months, you're gonna have a lot less vitamin D because the sun is not in the location that gives you that conversion. The other interesting thing about TB is it has a strategy of blocking the vitamin D receptor. So the more the vitamin D receptor is blocked, the less immune power that you have. And as a survival mechanism, TB knows that we need to lower your immune system to be able to persist in the body and survive. A couple other very interesting things about this. In the 80s, we had a swing up of TB outbreaks. Now, what happened in the 80s? They started to promote what is called this sun phobia. These campaigns to tell you to stay out of the sun and wear sunscreen and sunblock because the sun's very dangerous. That was in the 80s. And I really believe that change significantly reduced the amount of vitamin D exposure that we got from the sun. There's research that shows that low vitamin D does increase your mortality from TB, and then other research says it doesn't. So I started to look at the studies and differentiate what they actually did in the studies, and I found something very interesting. 
The studies that they said that there's no correlation between vitamin D and TB, they were using monthly doses of vitamin D3. In other words, you would just take vitamin D every month, not every day. You need way more than that 600 IUs that they say that you need for the bone health. You need at least 6,000 to 10,000 IUs, not once a month, but every single day. Not to mention, there's still no agreement on what normal vitamin D is. Some references say that as long as you have 20 nanograms per milliliter, you have enough. Other references say if you have 30 nanograms per milliliter, you have enough. But they're not really taking consideration all the huge barriers that we have with vitamin D. If you're obese or you're getting older, you need more vitamin D. Also, if you're trying to create a therapeutic effect with vitamin D, you need doses much, much higher because these levels that they're talking about are really merely to prevent something like rickets, which is really softening the bones in, in children, which is very, very different than if you have an immune problem or let's say you have an inflammatory problem or autoimmune disease. Those particular patients need a much higher therapeutic dosage. Or if you have an infection like TB that blocks your vitamin D receptors, you're going to need a lot more than this to actually penetrate the resistance. And so depending on the condition of what's going on with your health state, that's really going to determine what your normal should be. So when they do the studies, they're operating off of completely outdated information. Another really interesting thing, before the uh, development of antibiotics, people went to sanatoriums. These were a place in various resorts that was exposed to sunlight where people could go to heal from TB and they would use fresh air and sun exposure. And there were some really interesting statistics on that because people going in roughly had an on average of a 70% chance of having mortality, but that went down to a 30 to 40% chance. But through the exposure to sun, vitamin D, and fresh air, there is a dramatic significant improvement in that infection. They also use cod liver oil. Cod liver also showed a significant benefit to patients with TB. So the thing that kind of really struck me is this is not really just about the pathogen being exposed to this infection. It's really your body's resistant to the infection and how vitamin D relates to that. Now, your immune system kills off TB with this particular compound called catholicidin. Catholicidin is a broad spectrum antimicrobial that depends on vitamin D for its function. And based on certain studies, when people had low vitamin D, uh, the activation from the latent inactive stage to the active stage went up by 5x. So without vitamin D, you can't activate this powerful weapon against TB. So you're going to need a much higher amount of vitamin D than the typical RDAs that they recommend, which I think is like 600 or 800, which is ridiculous. The other really important thing I'm going to emphasize is that it's not just the vitamin D that's helping people against infection. When we're dealing with the sun, we're not just dealing with this ultraviolet B conversion of vitamin D in our skin. We're dealing with another wave of energy called infrared. And the infrared is not part of the visible light spectrum. You can't see it. It's invisible. But when you're next to a candle or a fireplace, you can feel the heat. You can feel infrared, but you can't actually see it. So over 50% of the sun is this infrared. And what's really interesting about infrared in relationship to TB is that infrared reverses the mitochondrial damage. Remember I talked about the TB and the macrophage? There's a lot of data that shows that infrared can reverse that hijacking effect and increase more oxygen in the mitochondria and increase something else called nitric oxide. All of those things are weapons against TB. And this is why infrared is used as a therapy for so many different things, for chronic fatigue syndrome, for helping your sleep cycles, for building up melatonin, not just for sleep, but also as an antioxidant to protect you. And it also helps increase vitamin D signaling. And this is why the sun has been such a great therapy for so long. Our DNA, our cells, our body was designed to get a lot of sun exposure. 
and now we live under LED lights, artificial lights, and just so you know, LED lights are really only the visible spectrum right here. You don't get any infrared. So we're getting this visible spectrum, this light right here, which is really heavy on the blue light, which activates cortisol, but no therapeutic protection against some of that blue light. So we don't get any infrared. 93% of the population spend most of their existence inside a building, not outside exposed to the sun, which explains a lot about this right here and why so many people are dying from this. They're just not getting enough of the sun to activate this here. And I'm not just talking about TB. I'm talking about a lot of other infections. And also as a side note, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the LED lights, they have a rule that's going to go into effect in 2028 where they're going to mandate these LED lights and make it almost impossible to get the lights with the infrared spectrum. Those lights that were incandescent are kind of being phased out because they're going for more efficiency in bright light and they're going to increase the intensity of this narrow spectrum right here. And I can't even imagine what's going to happen when people are forced to use these lights without the infrared, and especially if they're not going outside to get enough sunlight, it's not going to be good. It's also going to affect their sleep cycles, and they'll increase more cortisol in their body, and that can have cascade effects to all sorts of other problems if you're not sleeping and if you're actually stressed out. This TB microbe has evolved with our body for a very long time, and apparently we made an agreement and we're tolerating that microbe as long as it doesn't mess with us. But still, there's over a million people a year that die unnecessarily because of several things that weaken the immune system. So again, it's really not about the pathogen. It's about the environment. It's about the epigenetics, the things that control your genes. Now, since we're on the topic of light, there is a fascinating discussion with a doctor, which is just a mind-blowing interview on the benefits of light and we get in the topic of different wavelengths and how it can affect your body. If you haven't seen this video, you've got to check it out. I put it up right here.